that people have been acknowledging or worshiping something that they call God for a very long time. Uh, people see God, describe God in uh, all kinds of different ways. For example, the ancient peoples worshiped nature gods that represented the cycle of harvest and rain, birth and death. There were countless local gods for every purpose in every culture and every geographic area. For example, there were the Baal gods of the Canaanites and the Egyptians, they worshiped the sun and, and among other things. Uh, the Babylonians uh, did something interesting. They added the element of magic to religion with the idea that you could somehow manipulate the unseen forces. That was their great uh, contribution to all of this. Although the names and the rituals changed you know, from place to place, the gods of the ancients were made from the universe in which they lived. In other words, they worshiped the things around them. They made into gods the, the, the world that they saw around them. Along come the Greeks, and the Greeks worshiped gods that had human as well as superhuman qualities. Their pantheon of gods were like, uh, they were like actually a soap opera. A soap opera where the gods were marrying and they were at war with one another and they were grieving over lost love. You know. With time, the Greek philosophers developed a concept that merged all of these semi-gods into what, what they called the universal one. The universal one. They removed personality from their idea of God and saw deity as a ground force for everything else. You know, in the Star Wars movies, you know, the force be with you. you know, I saw reviews of the movie and, uh, you know, back in the day when they first came out, and they, oh wow, this new idea, the force be with you. you know, well, that was nothing new, simply a version of Neoplatonistic philosophy you know, recycled for a, Hollywood, uh, for a Hollywood movie. And then of course the Jews, uh, although a small nation, had a profound effect on the world at large because of their religion. They held that there was only one God and that He had consciousness and will and personality and power. They also believed that their God was the only God that existed and that he had a personal relationship with them as a nation in blessing them and protecting them and promising them a future salvation that would benefit them forever. We read about that and we go, yeah, sure, we know that. We've been reading that since you know, we're kids. But this was a novel, this was a dynamic idea that had not been uh, uh, present before among other nations. And so the Jewish religion had the most sophisticated and advanced theological ideas, religious ceremonies, and recorded moral teachings of its day. Now, these are the three, three of the four main sources for religious thought and practice throughout history up until today. I mean, as concentrated as I can, I can make them in a, a very short uh, lesson here. Uh, so there are still there are still variations of the primitive forms of religion being practiced today, especially among developing uh, nations. Uh, a lot of uh, native people here in the United States, for example, are trying to reestablish these ancient religions in the, modern, in the modern age, a kind of a restoration among them to go back to these native religions. Uh, the New Age movement, if you remember those terms, the New Age movement of the 90s, and the environmental extremists of our day have at their base the idea that the earth or nature is somehow sacred, is somehow the source of life. That's what gives momentum to their idealism about nature. To be at one with nature is to have reached the highest spiritual level. So that idea, you know, nature religions of the ancient past, still with us today. And the Greek model has also endured in many various forms as well. Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism mix the writings of the ancient teachers with the idea of this universal oneness 
and, and the highest uh, level spiritually that you can attain to is to be one with the universal oneness. Some call it nirvana, others call it moksha, but it's all the same thing. There are endless mutations of these where the goal is to merge with that ground force or that oneness that the Greeks talked about. Although the Greeks themselves did not believe that you could actually do this. All of the self-actualization philosophies rest on this idea and are the most popular form of semi-religious thought in America today, topping into, or rather tapping into the power in order to succeed through principles or lifestyle changes, so on and so forth. You know, if you could just tap into the force, get the things right, eat the right things, do the right, you know, if you could just do this, you know, you'd find that perfect spiritual balance, perfect emotional balance. So the ideas are being recycled today in a lot of modern thought. And Judaism, of course, survives today in an extremely politicized movement, modern Israel, the Zionist movement, so on and so forth. Islam, although they're loath to admit it, but Islam uh, owes much of their beginnings and historical roots to the Jewish religion, even if they are mortal enemies today. They don't really bring anything new religiously uh, to, the, uh, to the table. So I've said that these, you know, in a general way, represent three of the four main sources of ideas about God that mankind has pursued throughout history, uh, even to this day. There is a fourth way, a fourth idea, a fourth wellspring of ideas uh, for God, which many have had and worship, and that is, of course, the title of my lesson, The God of the Bible, the divine being revealed in the pages of Holy Scripture. The divine being revealed here is not the same being uh, talked about among nature religions, is not the same being of the philosophers, not, the same, not even the same being of the Muslims or, or Hindus or, 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 or Buddhists, not the same, part. some similarities, but not the same person. The God of the Bible is unique. The God of the Bible is different than all of these other ideas or descriptions of God. And so this evening I'd like to focus on this God, the God that we read about in our Bible. And the reason I thought this lesson was necessary is that there's so much information coming to us, so, much, so many ideas about God from other sources that we sometimes mix you know, the God of the Bible with the God of something else there to come up with some hybrid God that is not actually uh, uh, true or accurate according to the scripture. So God is the God of the Bible. Now one of our greatest problems in knowing the character of God is that we allow so many false notions from these other sources and religions to creep into our thinking. For example, like the ancient Greek idea that God is the force from which uh, come what we see and think, but we're not answerable to that force. You know, a lot of people who, who, who are very, you know, they, here's what they say, they, here's how they say it. They say, I'm, I'm against organized religion, but I'm all for spirituality. You know, you know what the translation of that is? Even God can't tell me what to do. Because organized religion has rules. Organized religion has form. Organized religion has, you know, somebody's in charge and somebody's not in charge. God is up here, you're down. You know, organized religion has that. Spirituality, well, yeah, that can be anything you want it to be. You know, my, my spirituality may be different than your spirituality, but it's all good. You know, as long as I don't harm you and you don't harm me, as long as I don't put your spirituality down and you don't put mine down, it's all good. Well, but that's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God that we worship. Or some people think that like the primitive gods, God is part of the natural world and not separate from it. You know, the tree is God, the river is God, I am God, the tree and me, we're one, and, and if I'm one with the tree and the river, I'm one with God. Yeah, that's a nice idea if you, you, know, you want to save trees. But that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is not described that way. Or like the modern idea of God that He can be manipulated somehow 
uh, for our success and happiness by following certain food or lifestyle, you know, 10 top ways to do this or that. You know, we borrow ideas from these sources and we mix them in with our own beliefs on God and we come out with some blurry vision of who God really is. The only reliable source for information on God is the Bible. The revealed word of God. Now, if I were speaking to an audience of unbelievers, you know, if I'd been invited to some other place to speak and they were not Christians or not members of the church, so on and so forth, I would have to supply some proof to back up the statement that I've just made, that the Bible is the only source for information about the true God. But I don't think I have to take a half hour to establish that we're here tonight because that's what we believe, right? But I would have to say, for example, that the Bible has hundreds of prophecies made in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the New Testament or that in a collection of 66 books written over a period of 1,500 years, no contradiction, no errors, all of these uh, uh, elements of the Bible point to the fact that it's a special book written by a special person, something supernatural about it. I'm not going to belabor that point here because we here believe that the Bible is God's word, so I'm going to move on from that. You know this and you believe the many reasons why we accept the Bible as God's word, so I won't, I won't spend time proving something that all of us agree and accept. What I am saying is that if we want a true picture of who God is, we must go to the Bible and only the Bible for this information. That's my premise here, and as Dayton suggested uh, I could go on all night and then he could pick it up and go on all day tomorrow and Marta could pick it up and go on for another week you know, talking about God. But I've selected a few things that the Bible says about Him. A lot of different ways that the Bible refers to God. I'll only choose a few that give us an overall picture of the God of the Bible. First of all, the God of the Bible is the all God. The God of the Bible is the all God. From the first verse of the Bible where it says that God created the heavens and the earth to the last few lines in Revelation where God presides over the tree of life, He is the all God. In Genesis 14, 20, during the earliest years of man's existence, again, Melchizedek, king of Salem, and priest blessed Abraham in the name of what? In the name of the Most High God. Now think about those times, the time when Abraham lived and Melchizedek was there. The world was rife with pagan deities at that time, and so Melchizedek referred to God who was above all the other so-called gods and deities of the pagans, the Most High God. By His creation, we can know that He is, for example, all-powerful because He has the power to create something from something that is not seen, Hebrews 11.3. From our reading of the Bible, we see that He is the all-knowing God because the creator of the whole must exceed the parts in knowledge. He is the all-seeing, all hearing, all discerning God, because to create sight and hearing and conscience, one must observe all, understand all, perceive all. To be able to create time, because the Bible says in the beginning, God must be beyond time, without time as a constraint. When Moses asked God who he should say sent him to the Israelites to lead them out of Egyptian bondage, God replied to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Exodus 3 verse 14. The name I am refers to his eternal nature. He is the God of time because he is not bound by time. In French, interesting, you know, Lisa and I, when we first became Christians, she used to read her Bible in French and I used to read my Bible in English and we'd read out loud passages to compare. Because at first, you know, we were under the impression that the Bible somehow was 
you know, it has been translated so many times that it lost its meaning because we were under that impression, we were new Christians. So our way of testing it was she'd read it in French and I'd read it in English and sure enough, it said exactly the same thing. Both of us were bilingual, speaking both French and English, but we, we kept comparing. Well, what does it say in Mark 16? Well, it says the same thing. What does it say in Acts 2? What does it say in Romans 6, 3? And she'd read it and I read it and, and we'd talk about it and say, well, it says exactly the same thing, doesn't it? And that helped us have more confidence in God. It was our own little way of doing it. We weren't scholars, obviously. We weren't Bible students. We began reading the Bible as adults, but it was our little way of checking to see if what we were being taught was accurate. And it was. So in French, the reason I say that, in French when we refer to God, one of the most used terms in the French translation of the Bible is l'éternel, the eternal one. In other words, instead of saying God, in French many times it'll say l'éternel, the eternal one. Only God can be eternal without time. This is an identifying mark of the true God. So when the Bible talks about God, it is referring to a being without limits, without flaws, without equals. He is the all God and He is the God of all. The Bible establishes this as first and foremost so that it is clear that there is a God there is only one God, and He is the God of all. So who is the God of the Bible? He's the all God, the all-encompassing God. Another thing the Bible says about God is that God is a holy God. That God is God of all is a primary teaching of the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. That God is a holy God is the fundamental teaching concerning His character. The prophets Isaiah in 40:25, Habakkuk in chapter three, verse three, and Hosea 11, verse nine, all of them, among others, referred to God as the Holy One. Holy in the sense that He is the opposite of evil, the opposite of darkness, the opposite of imperfection. He is holy and His holiness, His purity, is often described in physical terms as light or brightness, like fire. For example, how does He appear to Moses, the burning bush? And how does He uh, 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 appear to the people, fire on the mountaintop in Exodus 24? And when he appears to Moses, what happens to Moses? Moses' face shines brightly after speaking with God. So great was the brightness. You know, we have, uh, we have a brother here in the Lord who, um, uh, and I won't mention that his name is Calvin, uh, was doing some welding and he neglected to, to wear the mask. You know, the, the protection. He thought, oh, I'll just whip this off here. It won't hurt. And he welded, you know. And then that night when he came in, his face was red, his eyes were puffed up. Why? With that bright light there. Well, after a day or two, he was okay. He was here the, you know, at services. But Moses went to the brightness before the brightness of God. And his face wasn't burnt, it, sh it was shining. It was shining. That was the effect of Moses being in God's presence, so much so that he covered his face, not to cover the shining, but to cover the, you know, the diminishing shine as he uh, went further from God in his, uh, in his duties. The Ten Commandments, the rituals, the priesthood, the tabernacle, the temple, all of these were instituted to convey to man in human terms that God, unlike man, was holy and pure without any blemish or imperfection of any kind. If you've ever wondered, why are they doing all of this? You know, all the instructions on how to prepare the animal, even how to butcher the animal, you know, minute instruction that goes on and on, what clothes to wear, you know, how, how they had to wash, when they had to wash, the clothes that they wore, when they could approach, when they could, you know, why was it so complicated? It was complicated 
because God wanted to convey to man in human terms his unapproachableness, his purity, his holiness. His holiness is so great that man, being the sinner that he is, would immediately die if he came into the presence of God. So powerful was the glory of God's holiness. And of course, this idea was underlined by the rule, if you wish, that the high priest, and only the high priest, could enter the holy of holies, you know, that inter sanctum, if you wish, only once per year to offer sacrifice for the people and could only do it with God's permission once a year. If that didn't give you an idea how holy God was, I, I don't know what could. God has the authority to establish the basis or the law for what is right and what is wrong. He is worthy to receive worship and adoration. Why? Because He is the Holy One. He is the only Holy One. And there's nothing or no one in all of existence that can be holy except God. And the only way to become holy is to be associated or separated or set aside by God for His use. Do you realize you and I, we can't produce holiness. You realize that? Well, we can't produce, we can produce good works. We can produce praise, prayer. We can do that, we can manufacture that, but we can't produce holiness. The only way we have holiness is through our association with God, through Jesus Christ, by faith and obedience. That's the only way that we are able to have holiness. And then another, you know, the God of the Bible, another thing, He's the all God, God of all, all powerful, all people, all time. He's the holy God, unapproachable, pure. And He's also, and I want to bring it down to earth a little bit, He's the God of love. The God of the Bible is the God of love. In the Old Testament, uh, the main characteristic of God was that He was holy. The New Testament's main concept of God is that He is the God of love. Interesting. The story of the entire Old Testament is how God created a special nation and protected and nurtured them for almost 2,000 years so that He could take on a human form as part of that particular culture and people. I've said it before, the Jewish nation basically was a stage upon which Jesus would make His entrance. The story of the New Testament is how God in the form of uh, in the human form of Jesus, offered Himself in death as a payment for the moral debt of all mankind. That's the story, that's the, 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 the nexus, that's the, the core of the, of the New Testament. Now, how He gave proof of His divinity and offer of salvation was by resurrecting from the dead and establishing the church to spread the good news of salvation for the entire world to hear. He is the God of love because without being asked, He sacrificed an aspect of His divine nature so that His creation could have the opportunity to share the joys of divine-like existence forever. I mean, we went from being lost, lost, discarded, separated, wasted, suffering. We went from that to sharing in the divine nature. I mean, talk about a, a turnaround. And I don't have the answer to this. You know, preaching in a school or college, whatever, they, you know, they tell you, don't preach what you don't know, preach what you know. But there is a question that I have, and it's a, only a question that I have in my own mind. Did God alter somehow His nature so that He could include us because we're the created thing and He's the creator. Now, it doesn't matter what the answer to that question is, the motivation for that is love. There is no equal or similar expression of kindness or grace that human beings have done or are even capable of, even if they thought about it or tried. 
He is the God of love because no one else can or has loved as He has loved. No one else has given or has to give what He has given in order to save us. And yet we are witnesses and we are participants in that act of love. All right, so, so what? <laughs> So what? What does this mean? I mean, there's no end, again, as Dayton was saying, there's no end to talking about and praising God's character and His virtues and His works. I often think in my own prayers, imagine that. There are things that God has created that no person has ever seen yet or even imagined. There might be things that God created you know, in the physical world. There might be things that God created that no one except Him will ever be conscious of. Even the world will end, we'll never see it. I don't know if that is so, but I know, I know as a fact now that there are things that exist that we never see. We read about it in the paper all the time. Oh, they discovered a new plant, or they went very deep in the ocean and found something that no one had ever seen before. Never mind on the earth and under the earth and under the ocean. What about the, the heavens, the things we haven't seen? So what does all of it mean? This is the experience of heaven, where there is no time. Here we only have 30 minutes. You understand what I'm saying? Knowing God, plumbing of His character, having a relationship with Him, that's the substance of our existence in heaven. Can I make a little comparison? Do you all remember when you fell in love? You remember that? When you fell in love, when you were in love, him or her, you know, whatever side you're on there, you couldn't get enough, right? You just couldn't get enough. The first time you hold hands or perhaps exchange a, a kiss, good night, the guy goes home, you know, how many, how many songs and movies, the guy's floating on air. I, I think of Gene Kelly singing in the rain, you know, he's dancing and singing. And, and you've all had that experience, right? You're on the phone with the one that you love and you've just discovered you love her and she's told you, well, I think I love you too. Oh, <gasps> boy, bang, 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 your heart is going. You're on the phone, it's two in the morning and it's, I got to go, I got to get up tomorrow at six o'clock. I know, okay, good night, good night. Well, you say good night. No, you say good night. I love you, yeah, I love you too. No, well, you say good night. You, know, you hang up first. No, I'll hang up first. You know? And now it's three o'clock and you haven't hung up. Right? We, we can relate to that experience. You can't get enough of her. You can't get enough. That's what pushes you to marry, right? Because I want more. I want to be with you all the time. I want to sleep in the same bed with you. I want to be one with you. Imagine having that intimate relationship with God <laughs> where there's no end to it. With us, there's an end. You know, you know, what, what, does, what do they say? All marriages end in death or divorce, one or the other? With God, that honeymoon period that I love you and I'm finding out about you and I'm so excited and my heart is beating. Imagine that state that just goes on and on and on and on because there's just no end to the discovery of Him. So I'm going to leave my description of the God of the Bible at these three aspects about Him and finish my lesson by trying to connect what these things we know about who God is have to do with us here and now. In other words, so what? If God is the God of all, the God of holiness, the God of love, so what? Well, here's the so what. First of all, if God is the God of all, then He is the God of our prayers. We are the most blessed people because the Bible has led us to the only one who truly hears and can answer our prayers. Alan and I were talking about that just before 
services tonight. Someone, a doctor once asked me, if you had the choice, which bad thing would you choose to happen to you? You have an accident and you become paralyzed from the neck down? Or you have Alzheimer's and uh, you, know, you lose, you know, your body's functioning, but your, your mind is gone. You don't know who you are, you don't know where you're at. Which one would you choose? And I said, I would choose being paralyzed from the neck down because I could continue my relationship with God while I'm alive. If I have Alzheimer's, I don't know who I am and I don't know who he is. I want to have a relationship with him. I want to know him more and more until the day, until the day I die. The all God, he's the God of our prayers. We're the most blessed people, why? Because the Bible has led us to the only one who actually hears prayers. When you pray, remember that the God of all is the God who cares about all of the things in your life and can work in all of the areas in your life. Unlike pagans who had gods for different areas, they had the God of war, they had the God of harvest, and the God of love, and the God of rain, and the, you know. And what is ironic, they had all of these gods, but none of them worked. <laughs> that was the sad part. Nobody was listening. It's a comforting fact to know that there is only one God and He is the one we specifically pray to as Christians. That's the so what. If God is the all God, then He's the God of our prayers. Secondly, if He's the God of holiness, then at His people we also must strive to be holy. Peter, the apostle, said it this way, but like the Holy One who called you, you see, that's how He made you holy. He called you. You now have the opportunity to be holy. He says, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all of your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. It's not like you better be holy because you know, I won't put up with any, that's not it. I called you to this thing called holiness. You now have an opportunity to have this thing called holiness because I've called you. It is a reminder to us. It is an exhortation to remember who we are. We're the holy ones by virtue of association with God, the holy one, through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, we forget that God's holiness has not changed just because the world has changed since the days of Moses. There's no such thing as an Old Testament God and then this newer, more hip, cooler, more lenient New Testament version of God. God is always the same. He hates lying and stealing and sexual impurity and drunkenness and every other sin that men have ever committed. He hates it as much now as He did then. For us, this means that we should strive as diligently as ever to live holy and pure lives because we have, in 2014, the same holy God whose glory is blinding and who hates sin. It also means that we need to be um, reverential in our worship when we gather. You know, worship is holy, why? Because it's offered to the Holy One. Disrespect, inattention, disobedience of how it should be carried out are all insults to His holy presence among us when we worship. You know, people say, why you people, you know, the Church of Christ, you're all about the organ, you know, no organ. It's not about the music. It's not about the music. It's about reverence. We can't, we can't revere the holy God if we worship Him contrary to His commands. How can you do that? We are not a, an example of holiness when at times you know, during worship we're, we're late or we, we spend our time chit-chatting chit in the hallway or, or you know, we're, we're going, it's a good time to check your phone messages. You know? Does that seem holy to you? Let us approach the Holy One with the same awe and piety as our brethren did in both Old and New Testament times because He is still and always will be the Holy One. What makes us think in this day and age that we should not be as reverential towards God in worship as they were in the Old Testament when they entered the temple? 
You know, we can say what we want about, quote, Catholics, Roman Catholics, their buildings, their church buildings, the whole point of their church buildings you know, with the 70 foot high ceiling and all that kind of stuff was to try to cultivate a sense of awe in the worshiper. Now, I don't think we need to do that with a building. I think we can do that with this. But we need to remember we're worshiping the holy God. Amen. You know, I mean, Brothers and sisters, I, I encourage you to kind of pick it up a notch or two. And then, if He is the God of love, then there's hope for us as sinners. If God were, the, uh, were only the God of all or the God of holiness, we could know of Him and understand who He is, but we could never come to Him for forgiveness and encouragement and renewal because His holiness and our sins would be incompatible and would prevent this. The whole point of the Old Testament, the whole point of the temple and the separateness was to remind man, you're a sinner, you can't come into His presence. But because He condescended to reach out to us in love, because He bridged the gap between ourselves with the, and Himself with the blood of Christ, we can now enter into His presence through the door marked love. It's not that one of His qualities is better or more important than another. It's that because one of His qualities is perfect love, we can be reconciled to His other qualities of holiness and perfection. I am in awe of His all-encompassing power. I am in reverence of His holiness but I am eternally grateful that He is also the God who can love a sinner like me. So when it comes to God, let's be as James says in James 1.19, quick to hear, slow to speak, knowing that we are dealing with the holy God who is above all. And when it comes to time, or when it comes to the time to respond to the invitation at the end of every lesson, Let's remember that it's the God of love who invites us to come to Him, to cast down our burden of sins in repentance and baptism, to lay our cares and our troubles at His feet in prayer, to offer our hands and our hearts in service to Him through our service to the church. The true God of the Bible, the God of perfect love and holiness and power calls you to Him at this very moment as we stand and as we sing. Please, please do not refuse His invitation now as we stand and as we sing.